George Armstrong Custer. Everybody knows who he is, or do they? Was he a hero worthy of admiration for valiantly sacrificing his life in what he no doubt perceived to be a good cause? Or was he a demagogue, so convinced of his own superiority that he bit off more than he can chew and choked on it, albeit in the noble fashion? The answer to the question, who was George Custer and why did he do what he did, depends on who you ask and at what period in time you ask them. I'm Tom Morehouse, the history collector. I grew up in a house full of stories of history. My grandfather Frank was a motorcycle police officer in Bergen County, New Jersey, beginning in the 1920s during Prohibition. Before that, he'd been an army sergeant in World War I and fought in the Battle of the Argonne Forest. Earlier, he'd ridden with Blackjack Pershing across the border in search of Pancho Villa. When I was eight years old, I learned I had the exact same birthday as John F. Kennedy, the man who was running for president, and that my dad, like JFK, had served on a PT boat during World War II. The following year was the centennial of the Civil War, and with it began my lifelong passion for collecting, and through collecting, learning about history. All throughout my career as a high school history teacher, I used every opportunity I could to introduce my students to my collections. Now, it's your turn. Hi, welcome to the museum. Today on The History Collector, we're going to be using pieces from my collection to illustrate how the pop culture image of George Armstrong Custer evolved over the years, and how the zeitgeist or mood of an era can influence that evolution. From the very start, Custer's widow Libby did her best to convince the world that her husband had acted nobly, and that he'd had no choice but to make a last stand on the banks of the river the natives called the Greasy Grass. In the late 1890s and early 1900s, virtually every saloon had a lithograph open bar. A favorite of many was one called Custer's Last Fight. Here we see the first pop culture image of Custer, standing valiantly among his men, fighting against a savage foe. Variations on this image of gallant sacrifice were perpetuated for many years in different mediums, like Wild West shows, postcards, advertising, and numerous prints and paintings. In the 30s and 40s, kids in America saw the same image of Custer in the comic strips they read. This is from Dickie Dare by Milton Kniff, who went on to create Terry and the Pirates and Steve Canyon. Western and so-called True Life comics maintained this version of Custer, although they took liberties with things like his appearance. This is from Real Life Comics number 5 in April 1942. Custer and Custer's Last Stand was a favorite topic of the trading cards kids read and collected as well. In the movies, it was the same. Custer with his blonde hair flowing, usually shown in buckskins or some version of a standard cavalry uniform, standing his ground against insurmountable odds. During the height of the Cold War, also known as the heyday of the American Western, this version of Custer's image was maintained, but then things began to change. Here on the left, in a cover by Steve Ditko, who went on to fame as Spider-Man's co-creator, we see the traditional image. But on the right, in a story by Wallace Wood, for the first time, readers are given the idea that maybe Custer's motives were less than noble. In the lower panels, a trooper grouses about Custer's White House ambitions. In the 1960s, Custer and his actions began to be seen as a source of humor. The caption for the Playboy cartoon on the right, Who Says Blondes Have More Fun, is from a popular TV commercial of the day. Comic books began featuring Custer in some very creative ways. Here, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen takes a hit off Sitting Bull's peace pipe and hallucinates about an encounter with Custer in the 7th Cavalry. After being chastised by his dad for watching too much TV and being made to read a book, little Archie falls into a deep sleep and dreams he has a run-in with native warriors on their way to attack the 7th Cavalry. This is a great example of why comic books are often referred to as sequential art. On these two pages, you really don't need words to know what's going on. The TV-based sci-fi comic Time Tunnel actually has characters travel back in time and try to warn Custer before Little Bighorn, but he accuses them of treason and refuses to take their advice. The popular TV show Legend of Custer focused on the relationship between George Custer and Crazy Horse before Little Bighorn. As awareness of Native American culture grew in America, their version of the battle began to be known. No heroics there. Just a foolish move that cost Custer and his men their lives. Although the traditional version of Custer was maintained in British and European comics, 
as well as some conservative American ones. In movies such as Little Big Man, Custer was portrayed as a vain egomaniac who was only interested in his own self-promotion. Many times in pop culture, Custer will appear as just another recognizable figure from the past, such as in this example from 1971, where he, Abraham Lincoln, and George Washington all relate stories from their past which aren't true, confusing Superman, leading him to solve the mystery of the comic. The established version of Custer's Last Stand, though, still appears, such as in this dramatic splash page by artist Dick Ayers, in which the rawhide kid arrives too late to save the 7th Cavalry. In the years following Watergate, however, Custer, like many American leaders, began to be seen in a different light. He was thought of as a loser, only interested in his own promotion and not caring one lick about the lives of his men or the natives they were engaged against. Here's a great example from 1984. One of Steel Sterling's teenage sidekicks, a Native American boy, that's him in the red t-shirt on the white horse on the left, has a dream about the Battle of Little Bighorn. When he wakes up, he gets into a fight with a Custer impersonator who's an Indian hater. When given the opportunity to kill the racist, the Native American boy chooses not to, proving that he is the better man. Custer is a symbol of American xenophobia is also seen in this example from 1998, in which Clark Kent's ancestor, a Native American, observes Custer wantonly ordering the killing of innocent old men, women, and children at the Battle of Washita Reservoir. In the comic Superman and Nation Divided, Custer serves as a time marker, establishing the main character's presence at a specific event in history. In this case, an 1863 version of Superman flies over the skirmish at Hanover during the Battle of Gettysburg, in which the young brevet general, brevet meaning promoted on the field, led his Michigan cavalry against Jeb Stewart's Confederates. So what's the real story of Custer? Well, it's a complex one, because he's a complex guy. There's no doubt he was a brave and gallant soldier. His courage was tested throughout his life, and he never faltered. But as a leader, he made some fatal mistakes. He underestimated his enemy, and he overestimated his own abilities. And those are mistakes you don't come back from. And aside from a single horse named Comanche, nobody who rode with Custer that day did. Now let's take a look at my collection as it's displayed, beginning with that historically accurate hand-painted resin statue, sculpted by Terry Carsalis and assembled and painted by master modeler Will Leary. Behind it, we see two comic books published by the Avon Publishing Company that were released at the same time with art by the same artist, dealing with the two protagonists in the Battle of Little Bighorn, Custer and Crazy Horse. Moving along, we see an example of Europeans' look at Custer. This is that Italian comic, Cacciatore de Gloria, or The Hunter of Glory. You can see how his outfit in this resembles that of Will Leary's statue. Sliding to the left, we see my collection of Custer trading cards from the 1930s, 40s. I also have them from the 50s, 60s, and 70s and the cast of the TV show, in front of which are the reason why I'm into Custer in the first place. My 60 millimeter Ford Apache toy soldier set. Made by Marx, painted by me in the 60s. Moving around to the outside of the display case, this is the cover from a book about the Legend of Custer TV show. Actually, it's a British album, meaning it comes out uh, in a larger form. Below that, this is a post All Brands box from the 1950s, which on the back of the box, you found a picture of four famous Americans, including, among others, Stonewall Jackson and George Armstrong Custer. There's that Steve Ditko Cheyenne Kid cover. Next to that, is the double page spread from a Belgian comic called Spirou. You can tell it's Belgian if you look at the date, okay, written in the French version, not the English. I thought this was such a cool picture that I decided to use it as the backdrop for another display of toy soldiers. This is a kind of you are there look the Battle of Little Bighorn. Zooming in, here we see Custer on the right, 
dressed in his buckskins, as he is in the Spiro double page. Our tour ends with a British comic called Valiant, in which we see the rivals, George Armstrong Custer versus the Red Indians. Hey, thanks for dropping by the Morehouse Museum. Come back again. Till then, I'm just gonna keep on collecting history.